Hi, this is Dr. Mike Chupp, and you're listening to CMDA Matters, the weekly podcast of the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. CMDA is a 90-year-old organization of Christian healthcare professionals who take our faith seriously. Well, today I'm joined by my regular co-host and friend here at CMDA, Dr. Jeff Barrows. He's our Senior Vice President of Bioethics and Public Policy, and we will be talking with Dr. Eric Edwards from Richmond, Virginia. Eric is a longtime member and friend of CMDA who is serving in his eighth year on our Board of Trustees. He has a one-of-a-kind, amazing story that involves a journey into healthcare to become a physician and PhD scientist, as well as pharmaceutical company executive. He was challenged by severe food allergies as a child, and then was joined in a quest by his identical twin brother, Evan, to become a healthcare entrepreneur and strive to make life better for other kids with allergies, kids just like they had been. It is just like a purposefully creative God in heaven to weave a masterpiece who bears his image named Eric Edwards, who's now making a great difference for the essential drug supply chain in America in the backdrop of a pandemic. And he could never have seen this coming. Let's listen in. Well, I want to welcome to the microphone today from Richmond, Virginia, Dr. Eric Edwards. He's co-founder and chief executive officer of Flow Corporation, which is a pioneering public benefit pharmaceutical corporation. Dr. Edwards has been the CEO and has been able to assemble a world-class team around him who's committed to providing a solution to the broken essential medicine supply chain at an incredible time like this pandemic uh, with our over-reliance on foreign manufacturers for our nation's highest priority medicines. Previously, he founded a company with his twin brother, Evan, called Kaleo, pharmaceutical company also in Richmond, Virginia. And during his 16 years there, uh, he held a number of executive management positions, including chief science officer, responsible for all of their scientific strategy and pharmaceutical development, chief medical officer also, uh, responsible for developing medical affairs team and uh, capability while operationalizing the company's clinical program strategy. And then, pertinent to our interview today, Vice President for Innovation, overseeing Kaleo's research and development pipeline and overall new product strategy. And uh, significant to Dr. Uh, Eric Edwards' story is the development with his identical twin brother, uh, Evan, development of an epinephrine auto-injector with Kaleo. His education is a Bachelor of Science in Biology and then a Ph.D. and M.D. simultaneously uh, in Pharmaceutical Sciences and Doctor of Medicine from Virginia Commonwealth University. Dr. Edwards has been very involved in CMDA, both at the local council level, working with the Richmond CMDA Area Ministry, and uh, very involved with campus ministry with students. Uh, He and his wife, Autumn, and their three children have uh, been a great blessing to CMDA and to me personally, because Eric's been on our board of trustees since I came to CMDA in 2016. So welcome to CMDA Matters. It's been a pleasure, Mike, and it's just been, it's been an honor. And, and I can't believe that it's been on, you know, seven years now on the board. It, it seems like just yesterday uh, that I got involved in the national organization. So it's, it's an honor and pleasure uh, to be here with you and to uh, talk with your listeners today. I'm joined today by Dr. Jeff Barros, our Senior Vice President of Bioethics and Public Policy. And Jeff, uh, Dr. Edwards always has some questions that I think our listeners want to know. Like, it's just so common sense, and I'm I'm in the weeds, and so I've invited Jeff here to make sure we get all the right questions asked of you. Well, Mike, it's good to be with you again. Thanks for having me. Well, as I mentioned in the, in the intro, Dr. Edwards, you have a very unique personal story about how you grew up as an identical twin with Evan and how both of you were able over time to leverage your complementary skills uh, to pursue advanced education. You in medicine and in pharmaceutical science and Evan uh, was drawn to engineering. So what inspired you and your brother to found a pharmaceutical company either during or after medical school and then later uh, how this led to your current venture that is called Flow, the company Flow, P-H-L-O-W. Why don't you share your story with our listeners? 
Sure, I'd be happy to. And, and you know, I'll start out by just saying that, that there's a saying that is out there that necessity is the mother of invention. And certainly that was the case with my identical twin brother, Evan, and I. When we were at a small age, I, I think it was around the age of 18 months or, or even two years of age, we were labeled as some of the most allergic children that our physician had ever encountered at that time. So we grew up allergic to so many different environmental allergens, medication allergies, but severe food allergies to all eggs, peanuts, tree nuts, seafood, uh, milk at that time, um, and, and many other foods. Back then, there just wasn't a lot of awareness, nor prevalence of food allergies in America. And so we grew up in a state of being kind of those kids going through our school uh, age years who had to sit uh, at a different table long before the existence of, of peanut or tree nut aware tables that they now have all over the place to, uh, today. Uh, so it was definitely a, a challenge that we dealt with that really impacted us all along uh, the journey of our youth. Ultimately, I became passionate uh, with pre-hospital emergency care. I joined the rescue squad in my teenage years, uh, and Evan uh, was really excited about engineering. We are mirror image twins, left brain, right brain. He's left-handed, I'm right-handed. <laughs> uh, and we, so we complement ourselves very, very well. He would say that he's the good looking one. And, um, <laughs> but but we, we entered college with this idea because we never had our EpiPen with us uh, when we needed it. Uh, it was very cumbersome, large, bulky. Some of your listeners may, may not know, but the, but the EpiPen was, was developed in the late 70s, early 80s. It never actually went through a human clinical trial to get FDA approval. It was grandfathered in. Uh, and then became a, a blockbuster product when, when food allergies really started to take off in the late 90s, 2000s, and beyond uh, to this day, where you know over 6 million children live with, with life-threatening food allergies. Uh, so we uh, decided that there, there had to be a better way, something that we could do uh, as patients, but also as curious individuals who just were focusing on medicine in my case, and, and I always wanted to become an, an emergency physician, and then Evan focusing on engineering. One of the first courses Evan took at UVA was invention and design, and then we literally designed our education around this idea of creating a new epinephrine auto-injector to serve patients who were like us. So this developed by patients for patients mentality existed very early on. We had no clue what we were getting ourselves into, Mike. If, sure. if, we, if we would have known, we would have absolutely have never have started that. <laughs> That's true for a lot of things in life, isn't uh, it? Right. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, we, we started down the pathway of, of, of building a team. And by the grace of God, we were blessed to have great people around us who encouraged us around this idea. We thought we were building a device at the time and ended up being a drug. Uh, we ultimately had to raise uh, over $100 million to bring this product to market, but we used a complementary skill set, always focusing on putting the patient at the center of everything we did. And Kaleo is the name of the company that was ultimately formed. It's ancient Greek. It means to have a calling or a purpose. Mm -hmm. And we felt we were called. Personally, we, were, we felt we were called by God to serve this purpose of providing another life-saving alternative to what was currently the standard of care. And that created AuviQ, uh, A-U-V-I-Q, as it was the, the world's first credit card size epinephrine auto-injector. We went through the process of obtaining the patents and getting the clinical studies and conducting some of the first epinephrine auto-injector clinical studies to, to gain FDA approval of the product. And then all the challenges around getting the product to the market, uh, including the pricing and reimbursement challenges that are continue to be a challenge today in our complex healthcare system. But that's... Um, that's what we spent uh, 18 years of our life focusing on, building this platform, first with AviQ to help save lives uh, in patients living with life-threatening allergies. And then that expanded to other products and platforms. And ultimately, Evan and I left the company after spending all of the time building out the organization and, and working with just great people, amazing scientists, physician scientists, and uh, serving the needs of as many patients as, as possible. Little did we know that we would have children uh, who also had food allergies. And so um, to, to have a product that you helped invent then be used by your own child during an anaphylactic emergency 
it is something that is quite significant and life-changing. So it was an amazing experience at Kaleo and we learned a lot. More importantly, we saw a lot that needed fixing. And we learned that we are fire starters, we're entrepreneurs. Uh, we left to start consulting and my wife encouraged me to, to work on you know, other big things. And one of the things that we started looking at were drug shortages in the United States. And so Evan went into consulting. Uh, I decided I'm gonna take a chance and, and start another company. And originally the idea for Flow was all about trying to fix and solve for the critical shortages of essential medicines in the pediatric population. That is what the impetus was around flow. Uh, I had met a colleague of mine, Dr. Frank Gupton, who is a brilliant chemical engineer, organic chemist, who had come up with a technology to apply what's called flow chemistry and other advanced continuous manufacturing approaches to help make uh, molecules more cost effective and to bring back manufacturing here to the United States. So they had been funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, with about $40 million in grants. And they had built these great processes for drugs for TB, HIV, and malaria to bring down the cost of these essential medicines for the developing world. And then Frank and I teamed up to say, how can we leverage this platform to help solve for drug shortages domestically here in America? That led to the foundation of Flow uh, and then COVID hit and everything changed. And didn't you pursue that with uh, Frank as a nonprofit? I mean, it was something unheard of in the pharmaceutical industry. Yeah, so we started out as a nonprofit and then we realized that we were gonna have to raise a, a significant amount of capital. We didn't know uh, what was to come with the government contract, which we'll talk about in a, in, in a few minutes here. But so we were originally incorporated as, as, as a nonprofit and then we ultimately decided that we were going to have to firm up a commercial investor base. So we switched to a B Corp, uh, which is also unheard of in the pharmaceutical company. And so we are uh, striving to become the first independently certified B Corporation. And for those uh, listeners who don't know, uh, B Corporations are impact corporation. They are focused on impact in, in multiple areas. Uh, this is an ESG uh, type of company that really holds ourselves to higher governance standards, transparency in our pricing, uh, impact on the environment through the processes that we're building to try to drive down carbon emissions for the chemical processes that we're producing. And most importantly, focusing on a mission and a vision that is all about impacting this industrial base of essential medicines that has really plagued our country uh, with drug shortages uh, for, for decades now. Mm. Well, Eric, your story about how God used some significant health issues in your childhood with you and your brother is, is, is fascinating. And I just want to ask, in what ways has God grown your faith through this experience? That's a question I could spend an hour on answering, but I'll, I'll shorten it and just say that uh, it's amazing to see God at work through doing something that, that God invented, and that is work, right? Ever since Genesis, work was deemed to be good. And to be able to see what happens when you go from the early stages of your life just in education, and then the ability to apply that to some work that you're passionate about, mm. it's been amazing. God has taught me so many lessons around how success is defined. And for me, that journey has led me to focus not on success in the typical Merriam-Webster definition of achieving wealth, power, fame, or whatever uh, you would decide in, in a traditional worldly view, but more focusing on significance, significance in the lives of others and how you're using your God-given talents to impact other people's lives and allowing God to go to work utilizing your skill set, your unique unique capabilities, going back to something you said earlier, Mike, using your strengths mm. to really serve his kingdom. And um, that has, uh, it's been a process for me. I would say that I, I've been through many failures uh, in our first company. I really struggled with that juxtaposition of trying to be successful give the investors the return they needed, really try to drive profitability and, and allow this product to be successful versus what we set out to do in the first place, which was be significant in creating life-saving products. I also failed many times in making sure 
that work didn't become an idol. You know, it's, it's been amazing to see uh, the growth that has occurred and God's omnipresent nature in my own life as an entrepreneur as we started this new venture in flow and really trying to make sure that we focus on the things that matter most, mm. the relationships that we're building, keeping margin and balance in my life so that when I leave here, I'm still focusing on my loved ones, being present as a husband and a father, uh, but more importantly, always coming back in the morning and walking into this organization, knowing that what we're trying to build is something so much bigger than any one individual. What we're trying to build is, uh, is something that is going to impact the health of Americans for, for decades to come. And, and that uh, I've seen God through this, through the relationships, through the partnerships, through the amazing contract that we were able to receive for the federal government all along the way. Well, along that way, I know some of the story, Dr. Edwards, but, you know, Solomon told us that in our hearts, we plan our course, but God determines our steps. And you had a very wonderful vision in mind to help kids lower the cost of drugs that maybe were off patent and so forth. And that's how you got launched. But then you find in the middle of a pandemic with a drug shortage, you find yourself in the White House and you and Frank are suddenly uh, racing to meet some needs. And then, boom, at the end of this comes, I believe, the largest grant that HHS has ever given to a company. Tell our listeners that story. Yeah, it is. Uh, it is a crazy story. Um, so we, you're exactly right. When we set out, we set out for a vision for making impact specific to pediatric medicines and shortage. Ironically, a lot of these children's hospitals have been left behind by the pharma industry because there isn't a ton of volume there. Some of these drugs uh, that are needed for pediatrics in particular, there's specific pediatric presentations, but the hospitals only have adult uh, presentations that they have to use. And there's a lot of compounding that goes on. There's a lot of practices that are occurring in hospitals each and every day that really uh, don't assure the highest level of safety, efficacy, or quality uh, so we wanted to focus on solving for that with, a, with an impact on drug shortages for, for children's hospitals. But then when we looked at the medicines, so we were going to be stood up by uh, multiple children's hospitals wanting to work with us. When we looked at the medicines that they uh, wanted us to work on, COVID hit and we saw a 65% overlap with the key essential medicines that were already on the FDA drug shortage list that were going to be needed if the pandemic got out of control which it did. Uh, so these were drugs that are used for hospitalized COVID patients. Many of them are sterile, injectable, essential drug products. These, we're talking about drugs for sedation and pain and other ICU medicines, neuromuscular blockade agents used to innovate a patient. So uh, what we saw uh, before many others was that there was going to be a huge challenge in the channel in the distribution channel with hospitals pulling out these medicines and other hospitals not having access to them to treat COVID patients. So we reached out to anyone who would listen to us, the Health and, Department of Health and Human Services, the White House, uh, National Security Council, DOD, the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, BARDA, to say, hey, as you're looking for PPE and diagnostic kits and working to try to build vaccines and find ventilators, don't forget about these basic essential medicines that are going to be needed to treat these hospitalized COVID patients and other critically ill patients because they are already in shortage. And uh, to our surprise, no one was focusing on the issue. Uh, we got a call and had a visit on a Saturday from multiple government agencies. Uh, we spent eight hours with them, telling them what we thought the problem were, identifying the specific drugs that we had that were of concern. Many of these drugs, over 80%, are only made through their active pharmaceutical ingredients outside the United States. And we saw countries shutting down the exports of some of these products. In fact, in March of 2020, India shut down the export of 26 key essential active pharmaceutical ingredients. So we saw this coming. And when we went into the uh, previous administration, we were told, you guys need to help us come up with a solution. And we got to work immediately. We had great partnerships that we had established with another nonprofit pharmaceutical company, Civica RX, Ampac Fine Chemicals, and BCU. So we had the teaming agreements in place, and we went uh, and pivoted, basically, the original strategy to move beyond pediatrics and then to serve the needs of this public health crisis. 
And within two weeks of us receiving our initial contract from the government, we had delivered over 2 million doses of key essential medicines to the strategic national stockpile. And then just to come and, and, and ever since then, we've been playing a key thought leadership role and bringing back this industrial base. So, so Flow did receive one of the largest HHS contracts for a startup in, in US history. It was a contract worth up to $812 million, a $354 million base contract that was all focused on two things. One, rapid surge response to support the COVID-19 crisis, focusing on these essential medicines that were very vulnerable and continue to be. And then two, build an infrastructure back here in the United States, end to end from what we, uh, how we describe it from molecule to bedside, leveraging Dr. Gupton's great technology platform, this advanced continuous flow chemistry that allows us to uh, make these molecules more efficiently, uh, to decrease labor costs through automation, a better way of manufacturing, similar to what other industries have been using for years, but it just hadn't been applied to pharma, the government subsidized that effort for our people, processes, and infrastructure to regain our strength for, as a matter of national public health security, but also as a matter of resiliency for the future so that we could build this here and not have to worry about the next natural disaster or pandemic threat or trade dispute that could cause a major disruption in the supply of these basic essential medicines. Mm. And then finally, I'll leave with, uh, we, you know, we, we, as we discussed earlier and, and the impetus around flow, you know, the care of America's children has been unnecessarily impacted by essential medicine shortages. And that's led to compromised patient care, clinician mm. frustration, increased hospital pharmacy costs and, and significant inefficiencies. So we went right back to our roots and we launched a groundbreaking uh, first of its kind, Children's Hospital Coalition, uh, representing a, a coalition bringing together some of the nation's top children's hospitals. And um, they're collaborating with Flow because they told us that we want three things. We want certainty and availability, we want certainty and quality, and we want certainty and access and affordability for these key medicines. And so we've launched that as well now. And so we're serving both the children's hospital customer base now and the federal government to rebuild this essential medicine industrial base end to end. Wow. Well, Eric, it's clear that God has used you and your brother and others in these companies in, in mighty ways. And you've you've alluded to this a little bit, but I think our listeners would be very interested to learn how your faith informs the way that you do business. Yeah, I, I love that question. And I'll start by saying that for me personally, everything that I've done so far, uh, I attribute to uh, just God's provision. I am so undeserving of what's been provided to us and just so thankful that we have an opportunity to make a huge impact in this essential medicine supply chain. Uh, one of the first things we did at Flow was, was make sure that we had an ambitious uh, vision statement uh, and an ambitious uh, mission. But shortly following that, our focus was on our values. And uh, one of the first things that, that we did as a company is we came together and said, what do our values look like at Flow? What are the most important things that we should be focusing on? And so, you know, there were the ones that you would imagine, integrity, collaboration, innovation, but one of the one lifelong learning, but one of the ones that really hit home for me and what really epitomizes how faith can inform the way we do business is uh, we decided to include the value of servant leadership as a part of our company. And in our corporate headquarters here, we have a wall that has our values and many books are placed on that. We ask everyone to bring all the favorite books that, that uh, attach to these values. And um, I, don't, I can't tell you the number of servant leadership books that I've given away from Bert Jones and David Stevens uh, to the company. But those leadership proverbs, as you know, Mike and Jeff, they're timeless. Mm -hmm. And for me, every single week I open up and I read uh, a leadership proverb. Uh, and we've tried to do that consistently. But, you know, we try to instill in this company that value of putting others before ourselves and trying to put our egos aside and focusing on the mission and task at hand. And we have a place that's open that allows anyone to exercise their faith. But for me personally, it's all about what God's doing to uh, really empower uh, our team to do the extraordinary uh, when you're trying to 
do something as complex as reimagine an entire supply chain. Well, Eric, what uh, recommendation? I mean, you've got a track record of innovation and creativity, and certainly God's gifted you that way. But for any of our listeners, um, particularly young healthcare professionals who are coming up through the ranks and preparing for a career, what are some practical ways that they can develop an innovative and creative mindset? And then what sort of impact, what should motivate them? Your story is an incredible example of how the pharmaceutical industry, patient care, the economics of health care, availability of medicines can be impacted in a huge way. But just talk about creating that innovative, creative mindset and then how that might help our healthcare system of the future. You know, I think that faith-driven healthcare professionals and entrepreneurs have such a huge role to play in transforming our healthcare industry. And the reason is, is because they see the problems every single day with the brokenness of our healthcare delivery system. They are facing some of the, the most challenging ethical dilemmas, uh, but they're also able to see gaps in healthcare where you know innovation and creativity can be applied. So the first recommendation I have is just just listen to God speak and listen for that nudge when you see something that is not right or it's broken. Ask yourself, what could we do to fix this? Can we come up with a new process, a new product, device, diagnostic? And then know that there's so many resources out there of like-minded individuals who can help you realize that vision. But really it starts with someone saying, there's got to be a better way. And faith-driven healthcare professionals are, are really able to respond to risk differently than other entrepreneurs because they know that God is gonna provide no matter what. And so I would just take that uh, advice and know that it's okay to get out of your comfort zone. You may be in an academic environment where you're very comfortable and you've got a certain amount of percent effort that you have to apply to this on the administration side and a certain percent effort on the clinical side. But I would, uh, you know, if this is something that interests you and you've always had that kind of mentality of there's got to be a better way for this or there's got to be a product that could serve this, find that time to explore it further and know that God is going to be with you along the pathway, steering you. In many ways, sometimes he might steer you to say, that's, that's a bad idea. You don't need to be doing that. You know, there, there's too much risk there. Uh, and certainly there's plenty of times that uh, we've had ideas. My brother likes to say, I have 10,000 ideas and, and 9,999 of them are horrible. Uh, but, 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 but one thing that always uh, sustains me is that knowledge that God is there and is going to enable you to take some risky decisions that others would be uncomfortable with because we know where our true riches lie. Well, shifting gears a little bit, Eric, I know that you've been very involved in your local council and especially in the public policy arena. And I wondered if you would briefly speak to some of the things that have been happening in your area that's impacting followers of Christ who consider the Bible to have the authority on these issues and your perspective on all that's happening there. Yeah, you know, this has been a hard one to watch over the last decade because as you all know and your listeners know, there have been substantial challenges that have been presented even in the last five to 10 years that we never thought we would have to face as healthcare practitioners significant issues in challenging our rights of conscience. And what we see even locally here are battles that are popping up all over the place, right? So you have ones that have been around for decades such as, such as abortion, uh, but then other ones that are really hitting front and cen center that we never thought we would ever face as a local community. Uh, the, the example that immediately comes uh, to mine is, is as healthcare practitioners, we have an obligation to maximize treatment and benefits to our patients as a part of beneficence. We have an obligation to minimize harm, uh, non-malfeasance, and we're supposed to support autonomy for pediatric patients in particular, so going back to children, yet we're being faced with having to provide gender-affirming care and having to validate and accept, I should say, medication protocols that 
would be used to postpone puberty or protocols that require us to be involved in permanent surgical changes that are performed on adolescents who are suffering with uh, gender dysphoria or, or gender confusion. And these are hugely challenging ethical dilemmas that are facing health, Christian healthcare practitioners locally here in the Metro Richmond area and, and obviously beyond. And the challenge is, you know, we, we are supposed to put the science and uh, we're also supposed to put the Bible and biblical beliefs at the center of what we do as practitioners. Uh, but there's so many forces running against that. When we ask questions uh, around, hey, please validate these protocols that you use. Tell us about the evidence, the medical evidence for why you want to train students to do this or to require healthcare practitioners to refer for you know, a surgical change procedure. It's hugely uh, concerning, I would say. And one of the main reasons is because there is a lot of evidence that is lacking. As your listeners fully understand, there's little known about the long-term effects of both hormonal and surgical interventions in the pediatric population, yet we are being seen as discriminatory if we don't provide uh, gender-affirming care. Mm -hmm. um, so these are just some of a multitude of issues that are really having us having to defend our faith and go back to the Bible as to what we should be doing uh, when we took that Hippocratic Oath. Well, Eric, I do want to thank you and the entire Richmond Council. I, I think I shared this, and I believe Dr. Barrows would agree with me, that your council has done so many things, got it so involved, going to the State House, meeting together, supporting your members who are under fire. And uh, we're just so proud of your local council, and we wish we had 100 Richmond councils, honestly, across mm -hmm. the country because of your engagement on public policy. And I still I have a fond memory, and I'm, I'm really sad this is your last year on the Board of Trustees. I have a memory from Houston. I was telling Dr. Barrows about how uh, board members were coming up to the microphone there in Houston and talking to the various members who were attending this in this restaurant. And you said, all of you, I wish you could understand uh, how valuable these position statements that group a group of incredible experts have put together. They're available to you. They're very powerful. Use them. So you've served on the board, and as a board member, there's probably no better perch from which to see all that's going on at the Ministry of Changing Hearts and Healthcare. What aspects of this ministry at CMDA have you seen and feel are particularly vital for the times that we live in? Yeah, I think that the CMDA is in it. Now that I've had a chance to, to grow and, and mature professionally and, and be involved with multiple other nonprofits and other for-profit boards, I will uh, say to your listeners, listeners emphatically, this organization has one of the most well-run boards I've ever been on. And coupled with that, the ministries that the CMDA have been focusing on and really pouring into including with this latest strategic plan, they're, they're gonna be hugely important to allow healthcare practitioners across the board to have the resources to be equipped, to be encouraged, right? To be able to sustain the battles that uh, we're facing today and tomorrow. And I would just encourage the listeners here to not take those resources for granted, to make sure that they know that they can be playing a more active role in both their communities, but also on a national level, as we live in these difficult times that are challenging healthcare practitioners to be able to practice and practice while uh, being able to do so with a focus on, on their faith. So I think the National CMDA ministry for me has changed my perspective on the role a Christian healthcare practitioner can play above and beyond just patient care or just local physician or healthcare related aspects. What, what I've realized is the resources and the community that the National CMDA provides and even your local chapters provide really have equipped us to help others outside of the healthcare arena defend their own beliefs whether that's the local church or pastors in the community or others who are in a, you know, a non-healthcare setting just professionally who are asking tough questions around, you know, wh what does this mean for me? Going back to some of these 
challenges around three parent embryos and some of these other ethical dilemmas we've talked about on how to manage these big tasks and topics, gender dysphoria, those impact families, those impact Christians and non-Christians alike. They're in our churches, they're in our communities. And um, a healthcare practitioner is a professional who is well equipped to play a role to help provide guidance and resources here. And that's what I've appreciated about the CMDA, that it goes beyond just our local community of medical and dental and, and other healthcare practitioners. It transcends that. It allows us to really say, what can we do to go further to be a defender of our faith and our beliefs? Wow, very powerful. And I hope our listeners jotted that down mentally. You know, Dr. Barrows and I have uh, received more than one letter and sat in a number of meetings with others, whether medical or not, and had folks challenge us that if we as medical and dental and other healthcare professionals, we don't speak up when all these uh, facts are known by us. You mentioned earlier about uh, gender transition treatments. We know the literature. We know the data. One mother in particular of a uh, gender dysphoric son wrote to us and said, please, I've seen your website. I know where you stand. Please get your members more active in speaking out because you're healthcare professionals. You can speak against the professional associations because you know the data, you know what's been done, you know the truth. Please, CMDA, speak up. And I think our listeners have heard that from you today. Again, Dr. Edwards, one of my favorite authors as we close this uh, interview, Oz Guinness, um, talks about entrepreneurship, if you will, and his book, Carpe Diem Redeemed. And I'm going to close with his quote and get your thoughts, some concluding thoughts, Eric. Oz says that those who respond to God's call, who come to know him and walk with him in accomplishing his purposes in the world, are like entrepreneurial partners, junior partners, of course. Any final thoughts about being a junior partner of the creator of the universe uh, who just, it's humbling, isn't it? I've heard the word, uh, it's been humbling. uh, You've used that term several times during this interview. We have an awesome responsibility as Christian healthcare providers to to receive our calling from God and to use our God-given talents and our purpose to do great things. And it starts with how we treat our patients and their family members, but it goes much further than that. And to me, every healthcare practitioner is an entrepreneur when they are trying to find new and innovative ways to help serve the needs of patients and the healthcare community, leveraging biblical principles. And we can be entrepreneurs as we explore innovative ways on how we're gonna do that as we face the very significant challenging times of of the world that we live in. So I just encourage everyone to think, what can they do differently and how can they make changes occur or apply biblical principles to what they do each and every day And uh, how can we be um, more courageous as we do it and not be afraid uh, to take a stand? Um, That's something that I think about all the time because there's so many things that work against that. Let's be creative and entrepreneurial in how we think about having an impact. Well, Dr. Edwards, thank you for your time today. It's, It's been a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Wow. Creative courage is what I heard there at the end of that interview. I just continue to be amazed by everything that Eric, with God's wonderful help, has accomplished so far in his career and how his faith has guided and directed his steps into founding not just one, but actually two businesses that have had profound impacts upon drug manufacturing in our country and also the world. Well, one of the values that they focus on at Flow, his newest company, is Servant Leadership, as you heard. And it's great to hear that he's actually giving away copies of both Leadership Proverbs, as well as the book Servant Leadership, Proverbs for Today's Leaders, which were written by my friend and predecessor, CMDA's CEO Emeritus, Dr. David Stevens, and Reverend Burt Jones, who's now serving as Director of Leadership and Church Relations right here at CMDA. These two short books are the perfect gifts for any leader that you know 
because they offer truthful advice and wisdom for today's leaders. And as you apply these proverbs and principles in your life, you can become the servant leader that God designed you to be. You can purchase your copies by visiting cmda.org slash bookstore today. Well, I heard Eric give you the challenge to take advantage of all the resources that CMDA provides to help all of us speak up for our faith, as well as get involved with CMDA's advocacy efforts. I just want to echo that challenge he gave us because we have the opportunity. It's a charge and a responsibility that I believe Christ gave us to be defenders of our faith in the public square. If you want to get more involved with CMDA's advocacy efforts on either the state or the federal level, please just reach out by emailing communications at cmda.org. Our staff would love to hear from you. I call them the A-team, the advocacy team, and they will find a place for you to make a difference in the near future. If you're looking for new ways to apply biblical principles to your work in healthcare, whatever that may be, then check out Faith Prescriptions. It's a curriculum that's now available free to our CMDA members in the CMDA Learning Center. This is an on-demand video study and specifically designed to help you as a healthcare professional live out and share your faith in your practice. You can get started today just by visiting cmda.org learning. I want to let you know about another event that I hope that you'll take advantage of. It's a live event in our partnership with Dallas Theological Seminary and being hosted on our CMDA Learning Center. It'll take place Saturday, November 6th at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. And uh, we will be joining Dr. Daryl Bach as well as guests Dr. Laura Haynes and Dr. Gary Barnes. And they'll be discussing the misnamed conversion therapy and how that is impacting both healthcare and theology. There will be ample time for Q&A with the speakers, allowing you to contribute to the conversation. We hope you'll join us for this important discussion on identity and gender. It'll be a Zoom webinar, and for more information and to register, just visit cmda.org slash DTS webinar today. Well, there's still time to register for next week's Global Missions Health Conference in Louisville, Kentucky at Southeast Christian Church. And when you're there, be sure to visit our CMDA booths in the exhibit hall on the main floor, right smack dab in the middle. You can learn more about the various service opportunities that we offer through CMDA's mission outreaches. All that gets started, launch the first plenary Thursday evening, November 11th, and we would love to have you join us. So visit medicalmissions.com slash GMHC now for more information and to register. I want to let you know that next week on our podcast, we will be hearing the testimony of Dr. Katie Butler. She's the author of a brand new book, Glimmers of Grace, A Doctor's Reflections on Faith, Suffering, and the Goodness of God. I believe that her story is going to resonate with you, whether you're in the trenches taking care of very sick patients, or you are the spouse or friend of someone who's in those trenches now. I don't want you to miss out on some very powerful insights that Katie shares with such honesty and humility as a trauma surgeon who was transformed by God's amazing grace. As always, thank you for listening to CMDA Matters. Through this conversation with Dr. Edwards, I hope that you saw how God has used Eric in amazing ways throughout his career to be able to do remarkable things for the Lord's kingdom. And I know without a doubt that Eric joins a long list of CMDA members who are being used by God in mighty, mighty ways each and every day to further his kingdom. Paul told the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 9, 8, and God is able to bless you abundantly, believer, 
so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. My prayer for you this week, CMDA, is that God's provision will guide and direct your steps as you interact with patients, as you connect with your colleagues, and as you serve Him through health care, because serving Him through health care matters to CMDA and CMDA matters. Bye for now. This podcast has been a production of the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. The opinions expressed by guests on this podcast are not necessarily endorsed by the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. CMDA is a nonpartisan organization that does not endorse political parties or candidates for public office. The views expressed on this podcast reflect judgments regarding principles and values held by CMDA and its members and are not intended to imply endorsement of any political party or candidate.